So it looks like it's one o'clock and I think we'll go ahead and start our webinar today. We are pleased to welcome everyone to the 2021 Office of Cancer Clinical Proteomics Research Webinar Series. I'll be your host, Dr. Anna Roberts Pilgrim. And happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Um, our speaker today will be Dr. Minashki Anurag, Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. She is a member of the National Cancer Institute's CPTAC program, Baylor Proteogenomic Translational Research Center in collaboration with the Broad Institute. Her research focuses on cancer multiomics analysis and immune informatics with a primary goal to improve breast cancer diagnosis, treatment, and survival. In today's webinar, Dr. Anurag will discuss two aspects of integrative analysis and translational research in the field of ER positive breast cancer research. Her focus will be on the identification of protein drivers of endocrine therapy resistance in ER positive breast cancer through pathway centric analysis. She will also take a deep dive into hypothesis validation of her research through CPTAC generated patient profiling data and establishment of the roles of driver and biomarker proteins associated with treatment response. As a reminder, all participants will be automatically muted upon entry and any questions during the webinar can be put in the chat box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and will be answered if time permits. The webinar will be recorded and made available in the future on our OCCPR website under the media tab. OCCPR and CPTAC is proud to showcase the amazing work by Dr. Anna Rag, and we're glad you can join us on this cloudy St. Patrick's Day, and I hope it's not cloudy where you guys are. Okay, Dr. Anna Rag, I'll pass you the ball, and you can begin your presentation. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Anna, and I'm really happy uh, you know, presenting our stuff here. Thanks for the opportunity. So I think without further delay, I would start sharing my screen. And second. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see it. I think you're up and everything should very well. Okay, great. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to share my work here, and I'm really excited. And uh, so, like Anna mentioned, today I'm going to uh, show some of our work in the field of your positive breast cancers, and uh, also how we have validated some of our findings uh, from clinical trial data sets in uh, the recent proteogenomic uh, cohorts around breast cancer that CPTAC has been developing. So first, a little overview of uh, so first a little overview of uh, breast cancer, specifically estrogen receptor uh, positive breast cancer. So breast cancers can be broadly divided into four intrinsic intrinsic subtypes, as shown here, out of which luminal A and luminal B represent your positive subset, as evident from these Kaplan-Meier curve, luminal B which is shown in uh, cyan color is a more aggressive form of ER positive breast cancer as compared to luminal A's. And the standard of care for these two subsets of integrant therapy, which includes tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitor. Now, patients exhibit a gradient of response, as you can see here. So they can come up with same diagnosis, but will have different response to treatment. So we can have a uh, a patient who responds to endocrine therapy, who partially responds to endocrine, endocrine therapy, and then few patients will not at all uh, have optimal response to this particular treatment. Uh, overall, uh, about 15% of all reported breast cancer patients who will show resistance to endocrine therapy, uh, which will, can lead to metastatic events and mortality. So the number, this is a slightly older number, but the number actually comes down to close to 40,000 patients uh, will develop resistant to endocrine therapy. So now, when we started looking into uh, treatment uh, response in ER positive breast cancer, we wanted to see if, you know, what was the relevant data that was available 
And actually, uh, this there was this uh, great publication by uh, my colleague at that point of time, Harichar and et al. Uh, what she showed in her work was that in ER positive subset specifically, if you have higher mutation load, that associates with poor overall survival in uh, in in uh, independent cohorts, and it was not the same for ER negative uh, for ER negative subset. Uh, and so I had the honor of working with uh, uh, Swasti Haricharan, who was a postdoc in Dr. Matthew Ellis's lab when I joined. And so we started working on, on this concept together to further sort of deconvolute different D uh, DDR uh, repair pathways and see which are the pathways that are specifically implicated in uh, endocrine therapy resistance. So when we started this, this is where we began because there was so much of literature that was available. We started by collating different DNA damage repair pathways of uh, associated gene sets and using multiple resources and trying to identify which can we say are the genes that are uh, specific to a given DNA damage repair pathway. So for example, here, what do you see in yellow are the single strand break repair pathways and in orange are, are the double strand break repair pathways. And the genes that are unique to those particular pathways are shown in, uh, right next to the name of those pathways. And the ones that are uh, sort of interconnecting across these different pathways are something that uh, we call bridges, but these are basically the shared machinery of DNA damage repair, which is shared across different uh, DNA damage repair pathway. Because we wanted to dissect the role of in, uh, independent DNA damage repair pathways with endocrine therapy response, our analysis was focused on the unique set of genes, which was a sort of a representative set of different uh, DNA damage repair pathways. So when we started looking at uh, what is associated with endocrine therapy resistance, we are trying to see uh, if any of these DNA damage repair genes were associated with uh, proliferation markers upon treatment. So if the proliferation marker levels are high, that would mean that the tumor is not responding adequately to the treatment. So as you can see here, we came up with some candidates uh, belonging to these different pathways, uh, which were associated with KI67, which is the proliferation marker that we use. We use the mRNA-based MKI67 levels and also the IHC-based KI67 levels. And we found some of the uh, DDR genes associated with proliferation upon treatment. And when we took a deeper look, it looked like most of them belong to single strand break repair uh, pathways. I'm sorry. Uh, there, were, there was only one gene uh, which, was, uh, which belonged to Fanconi anemia data set, uh, sorry, gene set, which showed association with uh, post-treatment KI67. Other than that, almost all the genes were single strand break repair ranging from mismatch repair and nucleotide excision repair, base excision repair. So by this time, uh, what Swasti uh, had already established was the mute L components, which are the MLH1s, 3s. These are the components, uh, components that were shown to be drivers of endocrine therapy resistance in ER positive. She did uh, a massive uh, sort of knockdown study and uh, did all kind of assays, not just clinical data looking into it, but also cell line P and PDX models. So by this time, this was uh, very much established that MLH1 and also PMS2, which belongs to mutel, uh, mutel component of mismatch repair, showed association with endocrine therapy response. So now, while we were doing this analysis, we were able to add a few more candidates so this was a validation that we did in, uh, in Metabric, and we saw that SETN2, ERCC1, and NEIL2 were our additional three candidates that associated with uh, poor prognosis in ER positive breast cancer. We took these five genes in form of a signature and tried to test it across different ER positive data set that we could lay our hands on. So, of course, we did look into Z1031, which was sort of the, also the starting set that we did most of our uh, discovery analysis in. Uh, so no uh, surprise there. We do see that it's uh, lower in the endocrine therapy resistance set as compared to the sensitive set. But we are also able to validate the, the relevance of this five gene signature 
in uh, Metabrick and uh, Loy et al. data set. In Metabrick, uh, they received uh, different forms of endocrine therapy, which was which is not very uh, specified. But in Loy et al., they all received tamoxifen. So we were able to also see uh, different flavors of endocrine therapy uh, showing similar trends for these five gene signatures. Next, um, let me jump onto this next study because uh, this, you know, whenever you talk about higher mutation load or DNA damage uh, in tumors, uh, you do think about, you know, what's the immune landscape of, of these tumors. So, uh, around the same time, I was starting to uh, conduct this study, which was focused on luminal B breast cancer, which I showed before is the, is the poor prognosis ER positive subset uh, of, of breast cancers. And I was just trying to see if, you know, if there uh, are immune factors which are associated with endocrine therapy resistance. And actually this started as a more of a discovery kind of analysis. So here also I used Z1031 clinical trial cohort, but instead of looking at all ER positive, I uh, sort of looked only into luminal B cases where I had microarray mRNA expression at baseline and also had KI-67 levels upon treatment. So again, KI-67 levels would tell you how proliferating the tumor is upon treatment. And then the microarray baseline was to identify the genes that associated with uh, endocrine therapy resistance or higher KI-67 upon treatment. So when we applied different correlation cutoff and full change cutoffs, we came up with 30 candidate uh, genes which associated, which went high associated with endocrine therapy resistance. So here is the set of the, the scatter plot, and you see these are the proteins which associated with uh, endocrine therapy resistance when the expression of these proteins were high. Uh, so, and you can see MLH1 is here, and it shows that, uh, it shows the reverse association, right? So if MLH1 is low, it associates with endocrine therapy resistance, and if these proteins are high, they associate with endocrine therapy resistance. I'm sorry. When we started looking into these, we, uh, we sort of did a gene ontology enrichment and found that uh, these, uh, these genes that were enriched in tolerance induction, which here means the immune tolerance induction and negative re regulation of, of uh, T cell activation and so on. When we started looking at uh, the hazard correlation of these particular genes in TCGA, specifically in luminal B, we found that IDO1 and LAG3 uh, had the worst hazard ratio and uh, were significantly associated with poor uh, survival in TCGA. Then, like we did before, we wanted to see if this is not just, uh, you know, not just observed in two data set, we also checked in Metabrake. Uh, and where we were able to also perform univariate and multivariate tests. So this is luminal A, this is luminal B. And as you can see in luminal B, the IDO1 levels, if they're high, they associate with higher hazard ratio and is significant in both the univariate and multivariate setting. So this gave us trend to further look into uh, IDO1 levels and what are the associated pathways, what could be triggering higher levels of IDO1, so on and so forth. So the first step to do that was to see if uh, we could also see what we are seeing in the, these microarray expression data or RNA-seq expression data, if we see something similar at the protein level or not. So this is where we first started looking into the CPTAC TCGA cohort, uh, Merton Stahl Nature 2016 paper. And we found though, though the number of data points are relatively less here because of the, num the, the samples that were profiled, but we were able to see a uh, similar association that luminal B had higher IDO1 levels of mRNA and protein uh, as compared to luminal A's. When we started digging a little bit deeper in Mertens et al. data set, we found that uh, we were looking into, you know, what are the topmost correlates in context of proteins uh, that associate with IDO1 in the luminal B setting. And we found that STAT1 uh, is the top signaling protein here. So we heard it was the third ranked highest correlated protein with IDO1, and the only other protein that was on top of it was VARS, which is also known to be associated uh, with tryptophan uh, metabolism that IDO1 is a part of. Uh, when we looked at, I'm sorry, when we looked at uh, gene ontology enrichment, we found sorry hallmark uh, pathway enrichment. We found that these 
are enriched in interferon gamma response uh, pathways. Uh, so we, uh, so this is just to show you how uh, the scatter plot looks for IDO1 SAT1 at the protein level and IDO1 uh, uh, protein and SAT1 phospho levels. So as you can see in luminal B, the phospho association is much higher. In the meanwhile, while we were looking into these data sets, uh, we also came across a study uh, from SATO et al. We reanalyzed the data from this particular publication and found that IDO1 was the highest expressed SAT1 target gene upon interferon gamma stimulation. So we are clearly seeing uh, some effects of interferon gamma simulated subset with uh, STAT1 uh, overexpression. So we wanted to see if, uh, you know, this, how does this look if we look in independent cohort? Again, we went back to Metabrick because we were able to do some sort of survival analysis here. So this is the set which has higher expression of, of these interferon and other candidates that, that we identified, including LAG3 and PDCD1, along with STAT1 and IR, IRF1. Uh, and we did see that it was enriched in luminal Bs and associated with poor uh, disease-specific survival in metabric uh, luminal HER2 negative subset. We also wanted to check in ER positive breast cancer, what are the uh, immune cell types that are associated with IDO1? So we performed some immune deconvolution uh, algorithms. We ran those through the mRNA data that we had, and it looked like using two independent algorithms, Cybersod and Excel, ID1 levels associated with macrophage M1, uh, T cell CD8, uh, T cell CD4 memory, and Tregs. Uh, we were also lucky enough to uh, get our hands on uh, some of the IETC data. Uh, for IDO1 and uh, also TILS and PD1 expression. And again, we were able to identify or rather validate that IDO1 positivity, IDO1 positivity associated with FOXP3 and ITILS, which are markers of Tregs, and also CD68 and uh, uh, CD68 intraepithelial uh, staining, which could be taken as a marker for macrophages. Uh, so, while we were, uh, you know, analyzing all this and we published this study, uh, I was fortunate enough to get involved in, in the in the sort of the second year of breast cancer CPTAC uh, paper, which was a CPTAC prospective study. So uh, this is a paper that's out now. So if, if some of you have not read it, I would highly recommend. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I mean, not only because I'm part of the paper, but I would say this is a, a landmark paper because some of the amazing uh, biological findings that uh, we have put in in this and and uh, try to look at different DNA damage repair, different cell cycle, and different immune aspects of breast cancer. Uh, but just to show some of the correlative analysis uh, and strengthening of the hypothesis that we generated using clinical data set with uh, for clinical trial data sets, here uh, this heat map shows the sort of distribution of different uh, immune checkpoint components. And what you'll see is that ID1 is here, SAT1 is here, interferon gamma signaling is here, and you'll see that a luminal subset is highly enriched in all these components, and they, they look pretty orchestrated amongst themselves. So I think this is the, the risk group that we identified in our, in our clinical, I'm sorry, I don't know why this keeps on going. In, in the clinical trial uh, uh, study uh, that we did earlier. So we were able to see similar trends at the protein level as well, which was pretty encouraging. So here we also started looking a little deeper into PDL1 levels. Uh, and uh, because you know it's it's one of the most widely studied and, and used immune checkpoints. So what we found was if you're looking at PDL1 levels, uh, the mismatch repair score and nucleotide excision score uh, were inversely correlated. That means that if there is deficiency in nucleotide excision repair and mismatch repair, uh, those associate with higher levels of PD-1, stimulatory IM score, uh, cybersod immune score, so on and so forth. And this was very, uh, uh, this was a very strong correlation that we saw in luminals. If you look here at uh, the sort of these bar plots that compare luminal versus basal, you almost see an inverse trend for association of nucleotide excision repair 
with PDL1. So it's positively correlated in uh, basal here. As compared to in luminal, it's negatively correlated. That means in luminal setting, if there is nucleotide def uh, repair deficiency, uh, then that associates with higher PDL1 levels. So this is just a sort of a, a, a scatter plot that one of our colleagues developed. Uh, and basically this shows comparison of uh, the nucleotide excision repair scores and PDL1 mRNA in retrospective and prospective. So this is Mertens Nature 2016, and then this is uh, the recent uh, Krug et al. Cell 2020 paper. And you can see in both of these, you can uh, you can see the negative correlation of NER with PDL1 levels. Uh, so thus strengthening the hypothesis even further. So what we also were trying to look into are what are the other genes or proteins which are associated uh, with PDL1 mRNA level, and something came up which was very striking, which was epobeg 3G. It showed a very strong positive correlation with with PDL1 in both the subtypes in basal as well as luminal. So it's it's basically here in the coordinate that has higher association with basal and luminal cases. Uh, and so this was interesting also because uh, we know that if epobeg pathway is hyperactivated, you do see a higher mutation load, right? So, so these are the non-epobeg enriched cases with low mutation load, and these are the higher epobeg enriched cases with higher median mutation load. And uh, interestingly, some of the luminal cases, uh, which consisted of luminal A's and luminal B's, had activated uh, epobeg. Uh, uh, epobeg uh, enrichment status. So they had a higher cosmic signatures associated with epobeg, which is SPS13 and SPS2. They also demonstrated higher mutation load. And also some of those had higher cybersoc score, which again falls in line with the association of higher PDL1 expression with higher epobeg proteins. Uh, so I think just to uh, conclude whatever I've shown uh, today, and I'm sorry if I went overboard. Uh, but the methodology, so there, the work that I've done here or I've shown here can be sort of dissected into two aspects, right? So one is the methodological conclusions, uh, which is, you know, integrating molecular data with clinical annotations is key to identifying pathways influencing treatment response. And prote proteomics can complement genomics and transcriptomics-based evidences. In fact, in some of the cases, we saw even stronger evidences at the proteomics level than we were able to see at the mRNA level. Um, and the, translucent the translational conclusions here are that deficiencies in single-strand break repair pathways, including mismatch repair and nucleotide uh, excision repair, associate with endocrine therapy resistance in ER-positive breast cancer. Uh, a subset of ER-positive primary breast cancers have also been shown to have higher level of immune checkpoints and are enriched in endocrine therapy resistance subset. Hence, this could provide uh, an opportunity for alternative treatment for these patients or these subset of patients who will eventually not respond to standard of care, which is endocrine therapy. Uh, endocrine therapy. And at last, I'd just like to thank some of my mentors and colleagues uh, that have uh, worked on, on the project that I've shown today. So Dr. Matthew Ellis, uh, he's my mentor and collaborator at Baylor College of Medicine. I was a postdoc in his lab. Um, and uh, he also made us uh, pretty familiar with some of the clinical trial studies that he conducted, including Z1031, which gave us the power to analyze all that sort of clinical trial uh, cohort data sets. Uh, Swasti Haricharan, who was a postdoc when I joined the lab, so she was like my everyday uh, mentor in the field of DNA damage repair because she was so much interested in looking at mismatch repair and uh, single strand break repair deficiencies in ER positive breast cancer. She is now at SVP as an independent faculty and um, I consider her a DNA damage repair expert. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. Tossum Nielsen from uh, UBC. So he was uh, kind enough to provide with some of the IHC data around I uh, ID01 and breast cancer, which uh, was sort of a validation at the protein level, because at that point of time, that was the protein level validation that we could have in breast cancer. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks for sharing that. And a special shout out to Eric. So most of the 
most of the associations that I show, showed you with PDL1 levels uh, of different uh, immune components or different DNA damage repair components, uh, most of those uh, analysis were done by Dr. Eric Yannick from uh, Dr. Bing Zhang's lab. They're both at Baylor College of Medicine. I'd also like to thank uh, these cascade of people who are, uh, I'm so fortunate to have been uh, worked with from Broad Institute, so Karsten Krug, uh, Shankar Satpati, Dr. Mani, uh, Dr. Gillette, and Dr. Steve Carr. Uh, and definitely, I would like to give a big shout out to the CPTAC team. I've been fortunate enough to be a part of this, and I've learned so much since I became a member of the CPTAC team. And a special thank you to, the, to uh, Dr. Anna Robel and uh, Dr. Henry Rodriguez. And also, I'd like to uh, thank Alliance uh, for clinical trial oncology because they are the ones who uh, were partners in running these uh, clinical trials of some of the data that I, I showed you today. So you see there is a lot of teamwork going on behind everything that I showed today. Uh, and just to end, last but not the least, a special shout out to all the brave patient volunteers who donated their biopsies. And remember, these are different time points. So uh, they really did a commendable job helping us, you know, study uh, the tumors that they donated and uh, helping us, hoping we'll improve uh, your positive breast cancer survivorship based on our study here. Thank you. Thank you, Manakshi. That was a wonderful talk. You know, I, I really like your last slide because I feel like the patient volunteers are the backbone of all of the CPTAC research because without a good patient cohort, a lot of this research, you know, we wouldn't get as much out of the research as I think the CPTAC uh, group gets. So that's great. Can you tell us a little more about the um, the study design, the time points, et cetera, from the patients? Right. So the study design, uh, I mean, all credit to uh, Dr. Matthew Ellis there and, and Alliance team and his his colleagues at WashU, because this study, uh, the, the, it's called the ECOSEX E1031, this was carried out at WashU, and basically it recruited postmenopausal ER positive breast cancer patients. So women who uh, come with, a, uh, with the present breast cancer who are postmenopausal, so late age. Uh, so, the, so they received treatment of aromatase inhibitor, and basically the two time points where these biopsies were taken from which I showed the data on is uh, the first is as baseline, which is pre-treatment. And then the second one is after almost four uh, weeks or a month of endocrine therapy, which was aromatase inhibitor in this case. Oh, excellent. Wow, that is commitment by patients to yeah. do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I also wanted to ask about IDO1 and APOBEC 3G. So we've seen, especially APOBEC uh, 3C, in um, a, a previous study with um, oral cancer being one of the components that seem to change um, that makes this, this cancer uh, develop grow. And similar with IDO1, I think it was our our um, pediatric GBM CP tax study. Um, mm -hmm. Are you aware of specifically these two proteins being um, players in other types of cancer? We know PDL1 is sort of, you know, in everything, but these two I think are a little less known. Do you have any feedback on that? Yeah, so I think ID1 is pretty interesting. Uh, like you mentioned, it has been uh, shown to be implicated in other forms of cancer, but because you know the treatment are so different in different type of cancers, right? So, for example, here we see that ID1 high associates with lack of response to endocrine therapy, uh, but there are studies which show reverse trends, especially you know in cases where they have been treated with a different agent, uh, maybe chemotherapy or you know, uh, other kind of standard of cares, which are uh, there for those particular cancer types. But I think idea one is, uh, was of specific interest because uh, at that point of time, while we were, uh, you know, pursuing this study, there was a clinical trial that was running for idea one. And basically uh, it was a negative uh, a clinical trial. So they found that if, if idea one inhibitors are sort of administered, the patient didn't show 
the kind of endpoints that they expected to see. But I think, you know, one of the major aspects of, of these clinical trials, maybe not doing as good as expected, is because we don't, uh, you know, we don't stratify patients based on the IDO1 levels initially or mm -hmm. any marker that you're targeting. You're not doing that, that sort of stratification, which I think should have become state of art by now. So I think proteomics there plays a very important role to see that sort of association with different cancer types and IDO1 protein level or mRNA level uh, in stratifying the patients who would be receiving benefit from that particular treatment. Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the real goal of the CPTAC program is to get that information and get it to um, a level where you can stratify the patients based on on those protein showings. That's really great. Um, I do have one more question. We're going a little over time, but um, I'll I'll do one more question. It says, um, um, I have a very general question. Do you ever use preclinical rodent data in your analyses? Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, we do use some of the preclinical uh, rodent data. I mean, I'm I'm a bioinformatician, so uh, I don't do much of those sort of experiments. But for example, my colleague, like I mentioned, Dr. Swasti Haricharan, uh, she did some of the PDX experiments, so the patient-derived xenograft kind of experiments. Uh, and what we have also been doing very frequently is because you know these kind of experiments take time. We have also been looking at uh, PDX-derived cell line data which are out there, uh, you know, they have been treated with multiple uh, drugs and uh, you have screening results, whether they are sensitive or not. You have mRNA or protein level quantification of, of different markers there. So we have tried to do that sort of associative analysis as well. Uh, but some of the biologists that I, I work with, they do, do, they do a lot of uh, patient-derived xenograft experiments to validate our in silico hypothesis. Here's another one. Um, uh, uh, do we know about the role of PDL inhibitors on the expression and levels of IDO1 in breast cancer? That's an interesting one. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, so I think in parts, I would say they do have a sort of a modest correlation, PDL1 expression and IDO1 expression. Uh, but it's not as strong as, you know, for example, other immune checkpoints. For example, ID1 is more well uh, correlated with LAG3 as compared to PDL1. Uh, so while, I mean, uh, there is an association, but it's a it's a modest one. It's not a very strong association. Okay. And this is going to be the last question for the day. Um, can you comment on why nucleotide excision repair negatively correlates with PDL1 in luminal cases, but positively correlates with PDL1 in basal tumors? Right. So that that's again a very interesting question. And uh, you know, because we have been looking at most of these pathways to be working in uh you know, one of the slides that I showed initially, which was how we try to identify unique DNA damage repair genes for every pathway. So the analysis that I showed, some of those are derived from uh, that particular unique set of, of uh, DNA damage repair protein. Uh, so nucleotide excision repair, I think uh, we, ha we have shown this as part of some of our publications as well, which I discussed today, probably I should have had that working model here. But basically, if you know your sort of the DNA damage repair deficiencies there, uh, that affects in in ER po in ER positive setting. That means it's it's a little dependent on ESL1 expression level, and how uh, that implicates in the cell cycle checkpoints like CDK uh, CDKs, and uh, so that is what we have seen in ER positive breast cancer. We have actually not done a lot of experimental studies around. Um, you know, uh, the nucleotide excision repair uh, knockouts. So I would sort of, you know, hold my comments around that, uh, why we see that, but I think we have clarity on why do we see the negative association of nucleotide excision repair and uh, response to therapy. Well, great. Thank you very much. Those were really great answers. Um, and thank you for 
uh, speaking with us and sharing your work. It's very interesting and breast cancer is such an important, I mean, all cancers are an important topic, but this one has a, a, a lot of things that we know and could know more about in such a positive way. So thanks so much for uh, sharing with us. And um, I wish you the best of luck in the future. I'm going to take the ball back um, and share uh, the final slides for the for the webinar. Um, and again, I'd like to thank everybody who joined and everyone who had questions. Uh, we like to to know what you are thinking and how uh, you all could use our research to help your research, which is a really big part of what we do. So um, on that note, I will say thank you again, Minakshi, and thank you have so a much. great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you.